Now this is Hollywood Unlocked. Yo, it's Hollywood Unlocked Uncensored. I'm Jason Lee. And I'm Melissa Ford, a.k.a. The Curve Queen. She's back. Yo, it's damaged. What's good, y'all? <laughs> I feel like it's been forever. You know, we haven't seen you. The audience hasn't seen you. People have been asking where you've been. And, you know, everybody knows we've been talking here on the show that you were dealing with life, you know. And over the last couple of years, you've been, I mean, I think you've been tested a lot. And you've overcome a lot. But this last one was heavy. And, um, you know, just talking to you periodically, it seems like there was like even a whole self-examination and really like sitting and living in your, like you were really in it, you know, this last time with the passing of your mother. And, you know, we've known each other a long time, Melissa. You've, you, you were my friend when my mother died. Um, you've shared with me offline, you know, your relationship with your mom and your father and just all of that. and um but you've been gone so here you are so how are yeah. you uh how am i well that is a loaded fucking question uh loaded first stuff. of all again yeah, first of all um jason like wow okay i haven't physically like seen you and you are you're skinny mini like i can't believe it and i'm glad i'm glad that you came through um the operation and you're healthy and you're back to your old self so i wanted to i wanted to say that um can you tell though because i see myself every day yeah oh my god it's it's <laughs> jarring okay like it's jarring okay, so it's well, like look. i feel like i'm getting to know like a totally new person well, listen remember that conversation you and i had about only fans some time ago <laughs> i was wrong melissa i was wrong i was wrong <laughs> going to only fans so you might be called for a cameo just giving you a heads up okay well we'll just uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later um as for how i am um I'm gonna try my best not to cry, uh, but it's uh, okay doesn't seem to be the word that I should use. Um, I answer that question by saying, I'm putting one foot in front of the other and I'm taking every day as it comes and trying my best not to um, let moments get too big and start overwhelming myself with too many thoughts. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have to say that, um, you know, when the person that uh, is responsible for bringing you into this world passes away, it just, your whole outlook on life just changes, you know? And um, I, like, I watched her die. So it was, it was, it was like, it, this last, eight months of my life, the last two years, but especially the last eight months have been like a special kind of fucking torture because she was diagnosed um, pretty much around the time that I launched, I'm here for the food. So it was just like this moment where I'm like, oh my God, I'm so excited about this project that I've wanted to launch for years. And then, oh, by the way, your mother has cancer. And I was just like, oh my God, like, can somebody take their foot off my fucking neck? Um, and so hoping and praying that my mom was gonna make it through and um, and then seeing how, uh, how, how aggressive her cancer was. It, this, this cancer was it, was, it was determined to take her. And um, yeah. My um, and she hmm? kept it a secret, right? She didn't tell you at first. She she didn't know. Um, what's interesting is uh, while I was staying in her bedroom uh, at my aunt's house, I found her journal, and um, it was her 2019 journal, and she's writing about her symptoms before she even knows she has cancer, which is. Mm -hmm crazy being in, you know, stay, reading the book, the journal from hindsight and knowing that it's cancer and knowing that it is going to be such an aggressive form of cancer, it's going to take her inside of six months. So I'm literally trying to scream through the pages like, lady, go to the hospital. But I mean, this cancer was some, was some insidious 
shit. It hid behind her appendix, the most useless thing we have in our bodies. I don't even know what the fuck it's for, but it's like it was hiding and growing in strength. And then when it finally became full blown colon cancer, it just decimated her GI tract and her bowels. And it just, it, it, my mother was this big Viking of a woman, 5'10", long blonde hair, you know, just give her a hat with horns and send her out to battle. And the cancer just reduced her to like skin and bones. And it was, uh, it was, it was awful. And, um, but my mom is like, she, she died with dignity. She died on, on her terms. You know, um, there's a policy in Canada called made medical assistance in dying. And I think that only like eight states um, offer this where you can choose to end your life. Um, you know, if uh, you're terminal, you know, it's not like somebody who's like, oh, I'm suicidal. It's not like that. It's it's very much like Dr. Kevorkian. He was very much ahead of his time. And if you young people don't know who Dr. Kevorkian is, you should Google him. Um, but basically he was, they, he was called the suicide doctor. Yeah, he um, with, or uh, not so. the, not the suicide doctor. Well, maybe he was called you the know, suicide doctor. Assisted people with medical, medical assisted suicide. So people who wanted to pass on, but these yeah. weren't people that had cancer like your mom. These were just people who wanted to die. No, no, Dr. Kevorkian, he, he, he was, re it was really terminally ill patients that oh, he was. was okay. I thought yeah. the controversy was that he was just, well, maybe the controversy back in the 80s was that he was helping people die, right? Yeah, the controversy is um, playing God. Um, yeah. That was it. But now it's we look at it completely differently. And so um, in Canada, it's a nationwide policy that if you are in hospice care, if you are, you know, days or weeks, maybe a couple of months away from the end, then you can choose the day in which you're going to go and they administer the same drugs that they give to people on death row is potassium chloride or whatever it's called where it's multiple you know syringes um that basically you know kind of stop your breathing stop your heart and and that sort of thing and and uh my mom my mom decided that that was what she wanted to do because it happening during a pandemic her, the qual the quality of the remainder of her life was, in my opinion, stolen from her because she was confined to a bed. So it's not even like I could take her anywhere and like watch a sunset or anything like that. Like it's just the choices didn't exist. And my mom was like, I'm not going to lie here and literally waste away. And why? I'd rather just, I'd rather just go. And um, how much time did you spend with her before she just made that decision? Six days. Six days? Yeah. So, when, so you had gotten there six days before she made the decision to do that? No, uh, she already knew she was going to do it. Oh, you know, um, decision. Yeah, she'd already known she was going to do it, but um, I was, you know, racing against time because once you land in Canada, you are forced to quarantine for 14 days. And Canada doesn't play. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later no, in, in regards to how this country is handling the pandemic and why other countries their case their cases are dropping and why they're able to rejoin you know life as you know as they know it because every state here is acting autonomously whereas every country is you know kind of they they have they just have like one rule that everyone's following so once you land in Canada you are quarantined for 14 days the government checked up on me they called me to make sure i was where i said i was and, and if i to, hadn't you had, to, you had to quarantine somewhere separate from your mom for two weeks so no i was i was allowed to come to my aunt's house and the reason why my aunt was trepidatious about it is because my aunt is 66 and she has health issues she has asthma and um her uh, mother is 90 um, so, you know, it was like a house full of immunocompromised people. Um, but I had been quarantining myself. I'd been taking, you know, care of myself. And there was very, there was like five people on the plane going to Canada anyways. Um, but my mother told, you know, my aunt, 
who isn't really my aunt by blood. She, I just call her that because she's been in my life since I was like five years old. Mm -hmm. um, she was just like, I'm not going to last 14 days. You, Melissa has to be here. And so um, I found out while I was on my plane ride there that they were going to allow me to come to the house. And uh, as soon as I walked through the door, my aunt was like, um, prepare yourself. And so prepare yourself because you hadn't seen her before she got sick. No, I mean, you know, I had been going back and forth to Canada. Yeah. I mean, I went, yeah. I went back during Christmas holiday. I went back in, um, February, March. Um, you know, I, I had made a couple of trips, but it's just how quickly she yeah. disintegrated, like how quickly she just, you know, like the, the weight loss was shocking. Um, and just everything, you know, she was. What were they telling you to be be prepared for? What she looked like. Oh, because be by the last time you had been there, she had disintegrated more from that visit. But the last time I was there, she was still walking. Okay. You know, the last time I was there, she she still had hair. Oh. Um, you know, the last time that I was there, um, she was still able to eat, and that was not the case when I sat down at her bedside. She was, um, she was, uh, well, I, I wrote an essay and I, there's a picture of, of her and me laying in bed together. And, and that's what she looked like. She, you know, she wasn't my, um, she wasn't my beautiful mother. She was, she's still, of course, my beautiful mother, but just, it is amazing. It is amazing that like, you know, um, it's amazing the lives that we live and what we think is really important. And especially social media appearances matter and what we look like and what we buy and the lifestyle we want to promote to everybody. And when your mother is dying in front of you, you realize this shit doesn't mean anything. It doesn't even, it doesn't mean anything. Um, and so, um, I was in a rush to to say so much and ask so much, and um, I uh, if that's when your head gets all like fuzzy, like oh shit, what what do I ask? What what do I need to ask before she she's gone and I can't ask anything anymore? And um, I'm sorry to cut you off. No, go ahead. I'm sorry for your loss. Thanks. What was something that you you did take away from those last moments with your mother that you feel like that you will carry on? For the rest of your life uh i used to be frustrated whenever i would notice that i had i had i had inherited some of her characteristics i'm like oh my god i'm just like my mother and now i'm like oh, i am just like my mother you know and i'm proud of it yeah. um another thing that i took away from it was uh I didn't know my mother as a person. We take for granted that our parents are just there. And once we are in this world, that is the purpose for their existence, is for them to parent us. But we don't think about, you know, um, Damage, what's your mother's name? Adrian. Adrian? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't think like Adrian's life, like who is Adrian before you came along? You know, what was she doing? Like, who was she? I mean, I don't, I, I'm, I'm just no, guessing. I'm glad you said that because I feel like within your experience, um, I, when the last time I seen my mother, I said, do you have a journal? Mm -hmm. She's like, yes, I have so many journals. I was like, please like keep writing in them and leave them for me because this, the fact that you were able to read your mom's journal and really understand who she was as a person that really connected with me because of course, you know, I know that's my mom, but there is a huge disconnect from who she is as a person and who she is as my mother. Yeah, I I didn't, I, I just took my mother for granted as just my mother and you're my mother, so you're supposed to do this. You're my mother, so you're supposed to do that. But I never attempted to get to know who Oksana Barbara Reza Ford was. I never ever tried but I started to find out when I contacted her friends to let them know that she passed away. And, you know, just like my mother and just like me, my mother is a person who kept her cards close to the vest. You know, she's very private. Um, and so you don't really know when things are going on with her. So 
the vast majority of her friends were shocked that she died. They they had no clue she was as sick as she was. And, you know, that's that's my mother. And, uh, you know, all of them described her as like a saint. And I was like, who is this woman that you all are talking about? You know, because I remember getting into like some fights with my mom, but they were all like, your mother was the nicest, kindest person. She was so quiet, you know, but she was, you know, she had a cute little sense of humor and they just, everybody just remembered her so fondly, you know, and, um, and, and that's, that's one thing that I take away from it that I wish that I had gotten to know her as a person and it might have changed the kinds of conversations that we had as, as I was growing up. Um, but she, she journaled and scrapbooked, boy, did she ever like, I mean, for every single year, it's like there's journals marked 2010, 2009, 2011. And I'm just learning all these things about my mother that I didn't know while she was alive. And, um, she was a she was a pretty spectacular person, um, and and one thing I do want to say is um, I asked her, "Ma, is there anything that you want me to do for you that you didn't get a chance to do while you while you were here?" And she said, her answer blew me away. She said, no, she said, I had a good life. I'm happy. I was floored, floored. Of course I was happy, but then I realized, I just realized so many things in that one moment. I realized one, I had been placing all my expectations of what a good life meant. And I applied the things that I had done in my life with so much arrogance, you know, flying private, fucking first class, you know, dudes buying you shit. None of that shit fucking even matters because at the end of the day, if I was to switch places with my mother and I was on my deathbed at that moment, I wouldn't be able to say the same thing she said. I wouldn't be able to say, I'm happy. I'm, I'm okay with where I'm at. I would, I'm, after my car accident, I was like, I'm not ready to go. There's still so much I have to do in the pursuit of fucking happiness. And it just made me ashamed, you know, that I thought that, that I'd been so arrogant in how I was thinking. And um, it just made me realize that my mom lived a life of simplicity and it made it made her joyful. And it's made me really, really, really take stock of my own life and what I find to be important. And it's made me realize that I just have to live my life and and, and in the pursuit of just meaning and and, and living on purpose with intention. Um, and there's just been things that I've just been ignoring sticking my head in the sand, acting like an ostrich, running away from or using alcohol to cope or numb my brain. All of this stuff had to stop. Like, and the perf the idea, like the perfectionist kind of facade, it, it, it couldn't survive. It just couldn't survive. So I have a question. Did dealing with your mother, seeing your mother and having to accept mortality as being real, make you look at her as a person? Was that what helped you see her as a person or was it something else? Um, Cause you know, you think about your parents, you don't, you don't think about them dying. I mean, most people think like, these are my parents or these are the yeah. greatest human beings in the world. But like, did what, what was it that made you see her as a person? I learned about her parents and I'd never asked. I never asked. I because my grandmother was her mother was dead before I way before I was born. She died she died when my mother was 15. She was only 44. Um I learned about my grandparents and um I learned that they had a horrific horrific history. Um of my my grandmother's family was slaughtered by the Nazis in um, uh, Eastern Europe in uh, during World War II. 
and she was um, obviously, you know, assaulted, sexually assaulted, and forced into indentured servitude. Um, you know, forced to work in Warsaw, Pol Poland, in uh, an ammunition factory, and it probably contributed to her early death. Um, my grandfather was forced to fight for the Nazis on the front line. It was either gas chamber or take this gun and go. Wow. And uh, I did not know this. And the and even the paperwork that I found, you know, I've, I found um, paperwork that my grandparents were a part of this, you know, class action lawsuit related to victims of the Holocaust, living victims of the Holocaust, I should say. And I, I was blown away. And all of this made me realize how my mother became the person that she became and losses she suffered mm -hmm. and suffered in silence, you did know? It, did it humanize her in a way to you? I mean, completely, like completely. It, 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 again, the guilt, you know, uh, it made me feel like, God, Melissa, you are so self-absorbed. Like you couldn't ask a fucking question, but it just, when you're a kid, I've had to, I've had to really try to be very patient with myself and kind to myself and not do that self-flagellation thing that I do so well, where I berate myself for missteps in judgment or making human error. Um, but I, I just didn't, I didn't know these things. I just didn't. And, uh, it, it made me understand my mother in a complete, completely different way. Um, you know, I've watched documentaries on World War II, and to think that my grandparents had to survive that, and um, and then survive the journey from Eastern Europe to Canada, and that my grandmother didn't didn't last, um, she, you know, dying at the age of forty four, and um, you know, I that was one of the reasons why I asked my mom, like, you know, about the about the duration of her life, which she encapsulated by saying that it was good or whatever the case was. And, and she said it was good because I guess she made it, she made it good. You know, I, I also started to realize to myself, I don't have any fucking hobbies. Like, what do I do? What do I do other you than- hike, you, hmm? hike, you hike. But that's not really a hobby because it's got, there's a, there's a purpose for it. Like I'm always trying to lose weight, you know, or, or stay fit or whatever the you case like, is. Like you don't journal, you don't. My my mother um, painted with watercolors. She sculpted. She drew with uh, charcoal. She did needlepoint. She went to Aquafit. She had a book club, and every time they read a book, they'd go to dinner afterwards. And these were her activities, and they brought her joy. And I realized I don't do anything that is just for me. That brings me joy. That is doesn't isn't attached to a stream of revenue or you know, like people watching me do it, it I don't have, I realize I don't have anything. And, and so if I don't have activities that are just for me and bring me joy, then I'm going to continue to live an existence that is subject to misery because shit's always gonna change. You gotta have something for yourself. Do, and do so- you feel like you had something and along the way you lost it or you never had hobbies? I I would say that reading, reading is is can be a hobby. You, you know, it could be for educational purposes Absolutely. or whatnot, but reading definitely um, was something that I truly enjoyed to do. And I was like my mother, a voracious reader. There was times where I would, I would read three books like at the same time and finish them all inside of like a week and a half. Like my fa the fastest I ever read a book was like 400 and something pages inside of like, 12 hours, like I was voracious. And now I have the attention span of a fucking goldfish. And I, I think a lot of us do, that's what kind of social media and 24 hours news cycles and reality TV and entertainment, that's what it's kind of done to us. So I'm trying to take time for myself to, you know, meditate and be present and, you know, and, and, and just put my phone down and, I play meditational music on my on my TV so that I can just learn to be present so that I am not in a rush and I can actually finish a book again. You know, so I'm just 
I'm re-examining all of these things. Like, I mean, Jason, I mentioned this to you, like you, you, you said to me in a text, something like you, you're rediscovering Melissa. And I was like, mm, I think I might be redesigning her actually, yeah. you know, redesigning my life. Um, it's interesting. Like a lot of us are at that same place now. And for me, it wasn't a loss of a person other than I felt I lost myself. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, I know how euphoric it is where it's like now you're waking up trying to not only develop what makes you really happy and, and surround yourself with those that make you the best version of yourself. But it's also like, you know, then, then I'm, you know, 42, you're 43. We're also mm -hmm. looking at the clock. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I never really try to look at the clock, but then I, sometimes I will peek at it and go, damn, I wish I would have had this lesson 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. one text I text you, or I think we're texting and you said, uh, Today's not a good day. I'm I'm packing up all my mom's shit. And mm -hmm. I was thinking about uh how difficult that could have been. Um and so how did you work through that? For those people who are dealing with grief or who are having to do that or done that, I've never had to do anything like that. You know, I, I'll say this that my mother in all of her infinite wisdom and pragmatism um, was, she really was a saint because the business of death is something that is like, you're already grieving. You're already, you know, messed up because you've lost somebody, but then the process of the, the business of death, and I'm talking about, uh, insurance policies or, you know, cashing in, uh, uh IRAs or whatever the case is, or if that person has left a lot of debt, who inherits the debt and figuring out all of that stuff. It's, 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 a, it's a quagmire of like fucking bullshit, honestly. And my mother didn't leave that for me. My mother, you know, sold our house so that I wouldn't have to pack up the house after she died. And that is a level of kindness and and and, and forethought. Thoughtful. Yeah, and thoughtfulness too. You know, that I don't know, I don't know a lot of people that would do something like that. I don't. I don't know anyone who has that personal experience. And my mother did that for me because she knew me. She knew that I would attach meaning to every single thing in that house, a fucking sock. You know, she knows Melissa will never ever do what she ha what she needs to do in order to empty out the house, do the whole sale. So while she was, you know, dealing with cancer, she also dealt with the sale of our house and got, you know, basically got rid of everything that just she knew really didn't have meaning in the way that um, you know, a piece of jewelry or a keepsake box would have like furniture and stuff like that. She sold it all, gave it all away, stuff like that. And, you know, that in itself is, is, I just, I just was shaking my head at just how just thoughtful she was and just, just how much she loved me. And, and took care of me up until the up until she couldn't take care of me anymore. And so I had to pack up all of her clothes. And of course, I'm attaching meaning to everything like she knew I would. And uh, me and my mom are not the same size, not the same height. We're not the same size. So very little of her clothing could I keep for myself um, because it just didn't fit. So I had to pack up her clothes that still smelled like her and put them into bags and bring them to the Salvation Army. And, um, you know, that would be my mother. My mother would be like, I was, she would just say to me, Melissa, come on now, pack that shit up, take it to the Salvation Army. You don't need it. Like, this is what she would be telling me. And I'd, so I had to think like her in order to pack up the majority of the stuff that just needed to be donated, her shoes, her clothes, some pieces of, you know, just costume jewelry, um, 
just stuff, just stuff. And uh, it was, it was not easy. I would pack, I would cry, I would lay on the floor in the fetal position for about 20 minutes. I'd get back up and do it all over again. It, it, took, it took weeks for me to get through it all. Well, I know that you wrote an open letter uh, about your grief uh, with the past of your mom t with Vibe Magazine. One, how did you find the strength to do that? And why did you feel it was important to do it at that time, that early? I was so angry. I was so angry at this pandemic. Uh, I was so angry that I wasn't going to be able to send my mom off. I mean, we have we have grieving rituals, you know, we have funerals, we have memorial services. And I felt like, you know, my mom with as many people's lives as she touched, you know, friends and family, you know, we, we congregate and we share stories about how this woman, you know, um, enhanced all of our lives. I felt like she deserved that and she, we were being robbed of it and I was angry. Um, so that's why I entitled it. I was like, my mother died during this pandemic and I have nowhere to put my grief. Cause I just, I didn't have anywhere to put it. And I just was so, I was filled with so much anger and, and frustration and sadness that honestly, like the words kind of like just poured out of me. And then also I'd been online and I'd just been reading stories about people who had lost loved ones during this pandemic who had died because of COVID and couldn't touch them and couldn't hold them and couldn't really say goodbye the way that you want to say goodbye to a loved one. And I was like, that, that is a level of tragedy that no human should have to experience. And so I felt like when I was writing this piece, this essay that just kind of poured out of me, I was also writing it for people who had lost during this time and didn't have anybody, you know, didn't have any way to articulate their, you know, their emotions. And so I felt, you know, like I could speak for them. And a lot of people, you know, they, they said it resonated with them that, you know, they, they thanked me because it, they, they felt like I, I spoke their truth. And, um, you know, I mean, it made me feel a little bit better, but uh, not by much. I, I, I felt like I had to find a way to honor her. You know, I was, I was overwhelmed. So what have you, what have you learned about mortality? What, I mean, what has this made you think about your own mortality differently? Well, I mean, you know, the car accident happened like two years ago, you know, uh, late June, 2018. And then that was just like, uh, you know, like a hard climb out of the depths of despair, therapy, um, depression, suicidal thoughts, um, for, you know, all of that stuff. And, you know, being confronted with my own mortality and then two years later watching my mom pass away, um, it just made me think, it made me think that I, I really want, I really want a significant relationship. Like, I don't even want to date anymore. Like, I, I, I don't want to date anybody anymore. Like, the, 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 the one is the one. And I'm gonna know it. And I'm not gonna know it because we're going out for drinks and I'm like, oh well, no. I'm I'm gonna know. As a matter of fact, I think I know who it is. Um oh, wow. do we know yeah. who hmm? do we know who it is? No. Well, this is my question because you said you already know what it who it is. What about this experience made you go, now I know this is the person because now I'm looking for these things? He's um, well, the number one thing is that when I was leaving for Canada and I and I didn't know that my mom was basically on her deathbed, um, I was packing up my apartment and going to put my Jeep into storage and whatnot. And I he called me and I said, you know, you didn't sign up for this. I was like, shit's about to get really, really, really heavy and you didn't sign up for this. So I'm giving you permission to exit stage left and I won't judge you for it. And he said, if I can't handle this, I do not deserve you at your best. 
and he was like, I, he was like 10 toes down. I'm not going anywhere. And I was like, all righty then. Okay. Well, buckle up motherfucker. Cause it's about to get, you know, real. Um, and he's just been, he's just, he hasn't been intrusive. He's been patient. He's been kind. He's been funny. He's been supportive. He's just, and I love the way people love him. You know, that's one of the main things that, uh, that I find very attractive about him is how people respond to him. And I'm not just talking about a couple of people. I'm talking about like a lot of people. I've seen it. And uh, I think I, I find that um, he's a man of honor. And so I'm, I find that I'm seduced by different things. Um, this grown version of Melissa rather than, you know, what I was going for in the past, which was a lot of, a lot of looks, height, maybe money, um, maybe just like, you know, the pomp and circumstance of it. But at the end of the day, the character was heavily flawed and, and his just isn't. Mm. Yeah. So, so you went to the Dominican Republic. That's my favorite place. I uh, know. I'm super <laughs> jealous. I, I don't even know what the DR, how does it look out there? Like, are things open? So DR, um, I'm pretty sure that you've been, you were in like Punta Cana, right? I was in Santo Domingo. Santo Domingo. Okay. So I was three hours away from there in a place called Sasua in Puerto Plata. That's what I, where I flew into. And so when I got there, they had a curfew. And so on at 5 PM on the weekends and 7 PM on the weekdays, everybody you had to be in your house and and they really took it seriously people were not outside after that they like you know made sure everybody was off the beaches and stuff like that there was a lot of businesses that were not open some were like restaurants for takeout and and whatnot but um then if they had like outside seating then you'd be accommodated um <clears throat> but it was uh it was it was okay i i i went with takara and our girlfriend Liz and uh, our other girlfriend Monique and we rented a villa um, and it was 10 days of it was just awesome like four women in a house and everybody did their share of cooking did their share of cleaning there was no arguments no disagreements no nothing it was just it was really nice and they they were they really catered to the pendulum swing of my emotions. Cause you know, there would be days where we went to monkey jungle and zip lined and I, and I had a really, really good afternoon. And then that evening I am sobbing my face off and talking about committing myself to a mental health facility because the pendulum swing was so intense of just emotions that I was like, I am exhausted. Like grief is exhausting. I'll say that it is. It's so exhausting, and um, I realized that I couldn't. I couldn't white knuckle it through my problems this time. I just couldn't. So when I got back, I took a COVID test. Uh, that shit was literally like I feel like a shard of glass was shoved up my nose and punctured my brain. That's what that felt like. Um, so I took a COVID test, negative, and. Uh, and then I told my doctor, um, I think I need some medical help, like some prescription help. So um, she put me on some anti-anxiety medication just so I could get over the hump because I'm just, I'm tired of feeling like I gotta do everything on my own, just using my own willpower and determination to get me through my problems when my problems are just, fucking the size of Kilimanjaro. And I, I just, I can't, I don't even have a rope. So I did asked. You, did you, did you ever work through the accident, like fully come out of all of that trauma before this happened? Or was it like all, is it all like still compounded? It's all compounded because, you know, in entertainment, you know, we love a comeback story. And so, in that way, me trying to come back and, and be that source of inspiration for people was to my own detriment because there was stuff that I just had not fixed and worked through. Um, and 
and then ignored, you know, like that ostrich burying their head in the sand analogy. It very much applies to me. And there was just, there was still stuff that I had not learned to cope with, um, you know, and, and my coping mechanisms were, was, were going to kill me. You know, it was a, it was a little bit too much alcohol, a little bit of a lot too much alcohol. Like I thought about AA several times because that was my coping mechanism. That was what I used to numb, numb pain, numb anxiety, just fall asleep every day, you know, and I think you emailed me or mentioned, I don't know if it was on a call or text or email, one way of communicating that you were thinking about going back to school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, um, I, I always loved being in an academic environment. I loved, I did love school. I liked it. I liked my teachers. Um, and I have been feeling like, <sighs> I've been feeling like that is like an that is still like an open door and something that it's just been calling me for years. And I feel like my mother left me in a position to where the sky is the limit and I can and everything that I want to do for myself, I am now I can now do, you know. And I thought to myself in terms of <clears throat> the life that she made for herself there wasn't any stone unturned for her. Like I asked her, is there anything I can do for you? And she said, no, I, I pretty much accomplished everything. I came, I came, I saw, I conquered, I'm out. And I, I think that that's what that's she wants for me. A level of peace we all want. I mean, that's like, that takes, I mean, that takes a certain level of just real, like she's truly living her life. And I know like in this city and in our business, we are totally on a different track. You know, we, mm -hmm. you know, I have a house with grass now. I walk out and fill the grass every morning and talk to God and just enjoy that I'm alive. And I can't remember the last time I did that. I remember when I looked up one time and saw stars and didn't even remember the last time I had looked up and seen the stars. Mm -hmm. When you're walking, when you're walking on grass in your yeah. bare feet, it's called grounding. And, you know, that's the, it, it makes sense that you're that you want that you have the urge to talk to God or talk to the universe when you're when you're literally planted on like in the earth. It is because yeah. it, that's what it does. I mean, that's the that's the part of like when I was back in Canada and I was, you know, going through the grieving process, that's the only thing that made me feel peace was going on walks in nature. I would go and walk for hours and hours and miles and miles and miles until I was like sunburned, until Daisy was like looking at me like, bitch, it's hot. We got to go back. Um, but I just, I just kept walking and walk I was like Forrest Gump. Like, I swear to God, where he just kept running for like two and a half yeah. years. That's it was it was right after like a trauma. Jenny left him and he was all fucked up. You know, for me, like, I feel like grief, that level of grief, the best thing that you can do is head straight to nature. If it means you go to the beach, if it means you find yourself in a forest, it, whatever it is, nature is so healing and it sounds hokey, but it's just true. It just mm -hmm. is. And um, so I'm, I'm not surprised that you're really enjoying the house and, you know, the stars and the grass and having a lawn and the peace. I really didn't get it. The other day, Sky from Black Ink, she came by and she, as soon as she walked in my backyard, she took her shoes and stuff off and she put her feet in the grass. And I said, damn, that's weird because that's what I do that every morning. And she had explained the, you know, the grounding. She didn't call it grounding, but she explained that. But you know, it's one of those things where like, again, in our lives, we don't take in what the world is giving us. Like we don't look at the hills and the trees and we don't, you know what I mean? Yeah. And if there's an incline, I ain't taking shit in. At least this new fitness, Jason, is going to start inclining. But like right now, I need some time. I'm still, I got a new stomach. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, take, you know, be patient with yourself and just give yourself, the, you know, a wide berth to, you know, take on new activities. But um, you know, going, talking about this business, being in LA, you, you, you find, or I would say, I will apply this to myself. 
I found that I had been corrupted and it wasn't something one major thing that happened where like, oh, you know, somebody shows up and like, oh, sell your soul for this much, you know, and you get this. It's not that it, it doesn't happen like that. It, your soul becomes eroded over time because, you know, little compromises turn into major compromises and things that you thought that you would never do, things that values you thought you would never let go of being in this entertainment business, especially being in LA, you find yourself, you know, explaining things away, why you suddenly don't ha hold that value close to you anymore. You know, it's, and when I asked my mom about, you know, her, if there was anything she wanted me to do, and she said that she was happy, and I realized that I wasn't happy, I realized, the application of happiness, what I attach to happiness, all those material things, all of those uh, tang superficial tangibles, that was the corruption. That was it right there because mm -hmm. it's, it's inconsequential. It means nothing, you know, and go ahead. No, no, I was just agreeing with you. I think it's all about everybody's trying to find themselves. And when you do find yourself, you know what make you happy. And it's never material things. And I feel like it's sometimes the people that live the most simplest lives that are the most happiest. We have complex lives. We come here to LA, we're chasing a goal and we know we have to compromise within that goal, but then we lose the sense of who we are. And then yeah. even if we get those goals and get those dreams, we're no longer happy because we forgot, we got so far away from who we were. And I just feel like it's a good time. And I'm so glad that you can come back 360 and go i know i remember who i am and now i'm going to move in this path yeah I think yeah and i you think posted, and you mm -hmm. posted something on your instagram last night that i think is a sentiment that we all must believe in never feel guilty for doing what's best for you yeah and I think at times we're conditioned especially someone like you who's a giver right mm -hmm. uh, and i'm a giver in many ways that it's like you're always trying to give to other people and then you look up and you've given your whole self away and sometimes mm -hmm. people will make you feel guilty for being selfish. But like even the type of time I'm on right now with this fitness, it literally is about what the energy I create around me. It's about the journey that I'm on. And it sounded like from our last conversation or our last um, email exchange that you were on this new path where you were going to start doing what was best for Melissa. And I thought that would take a lot of courage. You have no idea. It, it, it really because you, you, I question myself just naturally, you know, um, but I also suffer from imposter syndrome. And um, what's really interesting about imposter syndrome is I think women suffer from it more than men do. Um, you know, it, imposter syndrome was a, a, a phrase that was coined like in 1978 by these two psychologists and they were studying, um, you know, women who, uh, like worked really um, high profile jobs. Um, and a lot of them did not think that they deserved their success. You know, uh, Viola Davis just recently had a conversation about how she has imposter syndrome. And this is Viola Davis, okay? Like she is one of the greatest actors like ever to grace a television or movie screen. And she has talked about her having imposter syndrome. And, um, and I suffer from it, you know? it's debilitating. Um, and it's one of those things that I have got to do the work to, um, get through it so that I can start to, um, praise myself for my achievements and congratulate myself and thank myself. You know, I, I wrote something on my Instagram page a couple of, uh, maybe yesterday, um, where I was saying, where I said, thank your younger self for who you are today, um, you know, because you're wiser, you're, you've survived, and it's because of the things that your younger self did. And we oftentimes, you know, berate ourselves. I know I do berate our younger selves for missteps and judgment and just being human and making stupid, stupid mistakes. But it requires, you know, those, those, those trips and falls in order to 
we require them to happen in order for us to become wiser individuals, for us to become, you know, compassionate, for us to, you know, be be able to like, you know, just be a better version of ourselves. And so rather than berate my younger self, I started trying to thank her, you know, for for being a resilient, tenacious, determined um, young woman who was just doing the best she could with the tools that she had, you know? So these are all the things that I've just been thinking. So my head is like completely full all day, all day long. And I'm trying to streamline all of it, you know? Um, and it's, it's complicated. It's really complicated. It's like you're getting some clarity because you sent me a really thoughtful email. <clears throat> it was a really, really nice email, um, and uh, you know, bittersweet, of course. But, but, uh, but I, I appreciated it, and hopefully, the return email showed you that I really appreciated the fact that you are thinking for yourself and what makes you happy. I mean, I know that, like, coming out of <clears throat> the car accident, you know, I was rushing you to get back because we missed you. You know, the mm -hmm. show. The show started you and I uh, with an idea of doing this. And then you came back. And then, of course, you know, there were some changes, high damage. And, <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, we, we fought through that and then went national uh, and, you know, fought through. But that was like in the midst of literally your storm. And I know like things were moving quickly. I was doing what love and hip hop. And it was just a lot was just like, and I don't think we ever really checked in with each other, but let alone checked in with ourselves. So when I got your email, <clears throat> You know, I, I can tell you put a lot of thought into it and that you put a lot of thought into your, you know, your decision. So uh, you want to tell everybody about that email? Well, it was it was the it was one of the hardest things I've ever written, um, you know, to say goodbye to the show because we started it together. And, um, you know, it's like. In my, in a way, it's kind of my baby too, and I love the audience. I love the audience, even when they think they don't like me. I like them, um, and it's just fun, you know. Like there's 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 a highlight reel in my head of of just the craziest shit we have experienced. I mean, we interviewed a fucking goat. <laughs> like <laughs> we, about the goat. we did interview. We had Prisha too and the cucumber. I mean, we Prisha with the cucumber. We interviewed a chair. Um, we interviewed a goat. <laughs> um, idols of mine have stopped by Jennifer Lewis, uh, Deborah Cox. Um, my God, like the list just kind of goes on. Um, we've had like incredibly thought provoking conversations. And the and one of the things that I've loved so much about this is that like uh, I got to introduce, reintroduce myself to the world because I feel like a lot of people just had a very one dimensional way of looking at me, like oh, Melissa Ford, the model, the calendar chick, whatever, whatever. Um, but now I, it allowed people to really actually get to know me, you know, not the glamor, um, none of that, just, just me and, you know, our relationship. Uh, unbeknownst to us, we had awesome chemistry. Who fucking knew? Mm -hmm. um, and it provided <laughs> for, for us <laughs> really good content. I, I just there's one thing I remember. It's like it was back in the day um, when you asked me, um, our last co-host, if I would fuck him for four hundred billion dollars, and I was like, no, like not a chance. <laughs> I didn't that even was, breathe. That was, that was kind of mean, but that was very honest. <laughs> Sorry, it was. I mean, what are you gonna do? Um, but the, I, I look, I look at those clips, and they bring me joy, and they're and they're funny, and um, and I love it all. But I think that this journey that I'm on is just gonna require me to do so much introspective work um, with my therapist, with my transformative coach, um, and these new hobbies that I'm taking on. Like one of them is deep sea diving. Um, and I just, and, and then school 
it's like uh, I, I I just have to see where where it all takes me. Um, finishing up my book finally. Um, just shit just keeps happening to add to this freaking book, mm -hmm. you know. So um, finally finishing that, and then you know continuing on with um, I'm here for the food. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I think life is gonna look like for for a while. Yeah. For a while. Just, you know, keep the door open. Yeah, and I just wanna say, you know, um, there wasn't a list of who I wanted to do this show with when I came up with the idea of doing something. You know, the 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 universe just aligned that you happen to be moving here from that penthouse in the sky in New York. Whatever, Claudia was on the list. No, Claudia was. I don't even know if Claudia and I were talking at the time. I mean, Claudia is always a good option because she's just a super great option and psychotic, right? She's yeah. Great. But no, I mean, you know, we we did have an offline chemistry that was great. Uh, our conversations were always fucking crazy and hilarious and the experiences we found ourselves in and it just translated to the show and we have built the audience around that and you know you have had a hard two years you know and I'm, I'm just glad that you're finally at a place where you're trying to find peace where you're redefining is it redefining or rediscovering you're redefining redesigning redesigning Redesigning. Way, I miss designing women. I can't find it anywhere <laughs> on TV. I'm not even on logo. I don't even know what it is. But I, mean, I, I don't know what happened. There's no pedophiles on that show. So I, I mean, but I know. I mean, you know, like I said, it was a bittersweet email to get. But I feel like you've been in a place where you've wanted to do what you're doing now to really focus on Melissa. And I think you love the audience and the show and your loyalty to it to where you didn't want to let it go before. But I commend you for having the strength to like just take control of your shit and move it forward. And I think I'm here for the food, which you created on your own. You created, uh, all, designing all the graphics. You now understand like how it ain't easy, but you've created a platform where you're having conversations that are literally in tune with like where your journey is right now in your life. You know what I mean? So it's sort of like, the universe doesn't make mistakes. It lines everything up the way it's supposed to. But I, I'm glad that you made time to come back and, you know, have that conversation with the audience and with us, you know, publicly because, you know, people love you and we love you and we appreciate everything you've contributed to the show. I love you guys so much. I love the audience so much. This has been like, this has been one of the, this is, this is the highlight reel of my life, you know, um, moving to California and then, you know, just kind of like hitting the ground running with this, with this show and, and everywhere that it took us. And, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm so, I'm proud. I'm, I love it. I am going to miss it. Um, but this is, I have to investigate this development of like this relationship with myself where I'm finally kind to myself, where I'm finally giving myself, you know, like uh, the, the permission to be human. And I, I, I just want to see where this goes. I, I have to see where it goes because I feel like I wasted so many years of my life being mean to myself and being cruel to myself. You know, I felt like in order to survive in this business, I had to say the worst things to myself so that anytime anybody criticized me or wrote anything fucked up about me, well, I've already told myself that, so you can't hurt me. And I didn't realize that what I was, what I thought I was doing was creating a suit of armor. A, a, a source of protection. But what I was doing was I was making it almost impossible for me to affirm myself, for me to be kind to, to myself, for me to be patient to myself. I don't even know how to talk to myself. I'm learning how to talk to myself in a kind and patient manner. And it has been a very trying experience because my default is to say, you're stupid, you're dumb, you know, you're an idiot. You, why did you do that? And I would never talk to anybody like that, but I talk to myself that way. And I have got to improve the relationship 
that I have with myself in order to be able to create healthy boundaries for everybody else that comes within, you know, comes into my life um, that I work with, that I exist with, that I'm friends with, that I am in love with. I need to, I need to figure out what that is. And God bless you if you've your if you've already figured it out and you're like 25 years old. It didn't happen for me. <laughs> it, it's happening yeah, for me fact, now. Yeah, the fact that it's happening when and where, like you know, I started Halloween on like the 37. It, as long as you get it, as long yeah. as you get the things that you've always wanted or the peace that you've been seeking. And like I said, I mean, listen, I mean, we all have a relationship outside the show that doesn't change just because, mm -hmm. you know, our relationship in the show does. And I, you know, again, I just want to say, you know, thank you. If I've never said thank you, you know, I really appreciated your support and your friendship and you showing up and knowing shit that none of us did and, you know, tolerating the chaos. <laughs> This has been a roller coaster ride. Somebody called us Destiny's Child. I said, "Look, don't fuck with me." You know, <laughs> you know like, it's, like it's been a it has been a ride. But you know, uh, I just wanted to say again, thank you, and uh, I've appreciated you know everything that we've experienced here in the show, and um, I'm just glad that you're on this journey, and I pray for the best. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, we're kind of on it together. You're discovering a whole new version of Jason. No so, no you know, problem. I mean, can we still go to Avra or are you not eating oh, that I, shit oh, yeah, right I now? Eat it, I eat it Avra probably twice a week. I eat it. Uh, okay. But the only thing is, <laughs> I can't get Bronzino no more. Ain't no two pound fish. It's just a little piece of meat and maybe a bite of spinach and I'm done. Okay, well then that probably eased up on your pocketbook too. Uh, so okay, good. We still we can still have like our over dates. Yeah, I like that. I like that. And damage. I mean, you have been such an incredible addition to the show. Like, you have been so awesome because me and Jason are psychotic, and you <laughs> have like rolled with the fucking punches like a champ like your level of professionalism is at sometimes it's scary remember you that, know remember after that first show he wouldn't do the dildo show and i called <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if this nigga's gonna make it this nigga <laughs> let me bring the dildo in here um, <laughs> <laughs> damage, yeah. Damage, oh my God. And I feel like again, the universe doesn't make a mistake. You know what I mean? And I've I've said on the show and privately, I agree with you. I think he's been a great addition too. Amazing. Well, I'm just happy to have this experience to work with Melissa Ford and learn so much. And every episode, learn a different word that I never knew from our vocabulary. But also, I just feel like you've always been a big sister to me and Jason, a big brother. And I just appreciate y'all taking me into something y'all built together been working so hard on and shout out to the audience everybody but thank you seriously yeah yeah, yeah. it's uh it, it has been quite a ride so again i love you all this isn't goodbye forever it's just goodbye for now well and i'm glad that you're keeping i'm here for the food going so people can still follow you over there if you're not following on youtube you have to if you're follow not following on instagram you can keep up with the episodes uh, I, I'm I'm over, I'm down to pop over there if you ever need you know a very intelligent, sexy OnlyFans uh, account holder. Well, you know what? We still haven't done the episode about your book. Like your oh, book is book still is, for girl, sale, girl. The book is for sale, but it's like nine months later. Maybe when I, mean, I drop the, maybe when I drop the audio book with the extras in it. Okay, we, the unabridged version. Yes, yes. Yeah. Unabridged. Okay. Unabridged. The word I didn't know. Yeah, unabridged version. So yeah, that's that's what you do. Okay, then so then you'll come on for that. That will be perfect. And then I'll see you at Avra. Yes, anytime. Okay, well listen, um, I'm going to say goodbye for me and damage and Melissa, you can have the last word and we're out of here. All right. Bye everybody. Bye, Hollywood Unlocked fans. I love you guys. Check me out on I'm here for the food. It's on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, the whole nine. Um, like I said, this is just goodbye for now, not goodbye forever. Peace. What up, YouTube? Thank you for watching this reckless show. Yeah, and hit that subscribe button and don't forget to hit the notification bell. And also don't forget to share and leave a comment because we are reading.